talking about emulators and emulation. Emulating a trip through my childhood one machine at a time. So hi, I'm Craig Maloney, and this is my childhood. A little you know though, I love computers. I mean, I love a lot of computers. I love a lot of classic computers. There was a, when I was younger though, there was um, I'm sorry, first off, I'm not going to really talk too much about IBM computers. There's DOS EMU for that. Um, I don't really have a whole lot of fondness for DOS computers, as it may be obvious. No, not a whole lot of love for this guy, uh, <laughs> as far as his, his machinations and whatnot in the, uh, in the computer industry. I mean, he got, he got x86 machines on everyone's desktops, though. Right. So, you all can emulate DOS as much as you possibly can, because you already have the hardware. It's already baked in. So, I discovered computers a while ago through the way that everyone back in the 1970s discovered computers through the World Book Encyclopedia. <laughs> Unfortunately, uh, because there was no, nothing a little more up to date, this is what I thought a computer was back in the 1970s, which was partially true. Uh, however, it neglected that there was a personal computer revolution. So, for the longest time, I thought this is the only way that I'm going to be able to work on computers in this giant server room, tape drives, guys hanging out in rather natty looking shirts. <coughs> it was depressing. Until finally, I realized. Now, I'm going to do a little object lesson here. For the first time that I saw an Apple II computer, I only saw the top part up here. And I thought, wow, that's interesting. It's a, a mini computer called the Apple. I wonder how that works. It wasn't until later that I realized that the Apple could hook up to a television set and it had a keyboard. And I'm like, personal computers? What the heck are those? I can have a computer at my house? I don't have to have something that's about the size of the Empire State Building in order to house my computer? That's awesome. So, unfortunately for my parents, I realized that there were computers out there and that I could have them. So I went to places like Computerland, which was kind of like Mecca for me, or Radio Shack, which had all the TRS-80 computers, or the Doll Hospital and Toy, Toy Soldier Shop, back when they actually had computers that they sold. Well, I see them was big, too. I don't think I ever went there, but... And then there was, uh, there's Popular Computing, which is a magazine that I had the entire run of, uh, because I got the premiere edition. It was awesome. <laughs> this is a heady time. And I made a list of the computers that I wanted. Uh, Tried to narrow it down just a little bit, and these were pretty much all the computers. I mean, you got the Heathkit H89, Sinclair ZX80, PET 2001, AIM 65, Apple II, TRS-80 Coco, um, color computer, the Model 3, uh, VIC-20, and the Atari 400. You sell for 400? 800? Yeah. Well, I was cheap as oh, well. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got a crappy keyboard. You gotta start yeah, well, my parents were cheap as well. Um, I, I would, I, honestly, I would have put together the Sinclair ZX81, or ZX80. Um, no, nothing about soldering to this day, but I was going to put that sucker together if it meant I could have a computer. Yeah. Then, something happened. Something Christmas morning happened. <laughs> I opened the box, and lo and behold, was my first computer. Ta-da! Angelic chorus. I had an Atari 400. This isn't actually the Atari 400 that I had. Um, unfortunately, being a kid and the fact that I got the 800 afterward, I took it apart and I couldn't get it back together again. And one of the few times that my dad has actually yelled at me was the time that he stumbled into my bedroom and saw the computer that he had bought for me all over on the floor. It was not a happy camper. How old were you at, at the Christmas that you got that? Uh, <laughs> old enough to know better. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll mention that. Um, I think it was 1982. Wow. Was. I was around 10-ish. Um, so, and I learned basic programming on there. <laughs> but there are three things wrong with this picture. Number one, this is for the Atari 2600. Number two, I don't think anyone in this room has ever actually done programming quite like that. And number three, programming on the Atari 26... Wait, 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 what, what, what did you say? 
I said, this is for the Atari 2600. This is a cartridge for the 2600. Right, yeah, yeah. Secondly, I don't think any programmer here has ever actually programmed quite like that. By toggling in a program into a... Uh, no, 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 no. I mean, like, looking like you're space. some futuristic Buck Rogers oh, person. Yeah, we all do that. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and number three... You're talking about toggling your program into... No, 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 no. Yeah. No, that... that or, I, I know. But the other thing is that programming in the 2600 never looked like that, ever. And this is definitely a, a, a part of Atari's brilliance in marketing, was being able to come up with covers that made you think that was what was going to be, what was inside, but really didn't mean, uh, match reality. So I did a lot of programming. Yep. I did a hell of a lot of programming. I love that, that game. game. <laughs> <laughs> I love that game. That was, yes, lots of programming in that machine. So eventually I got the Atari 800, and that was a brilliant computer. Of course, it is obviously the, uh, the personal computer that will never become obsolete. I, wrote, I pretty much did that. Um, later on, there was the Atari ST and the Amiga and that, but those weren't for me. Those computers weren't as great as the Atari for me. So I upgraded to the Atari 800 XL. I got a hard drive for that thing. I actually had a 40 megabyte hard drive hanging off of that thing, SCSI. Paid, paid about as much as the Amiga for it, which in retrospect probably wasn't the smartest thing I could have done, but I rode that way about. The Atari 8-bit computers lasted from 79 till around 92. I rode that wave from 81 to 1993. So I got a lot invested in the Atari. There's a lot of nostalgia in there. All right, all right. <clears throat> So what is emulation? Emulation is taking basically the computer that's over here along with all the peripherals that are part of that computer, that make up the computer, because there's only just enough brains in here to run something off of a television set or a monitor. You also have the external drives, like tape drives and all that stuff. You got printers that you can emulate, uh, joystick interfaces. I'm not sure what the heck all this stuff is over here, but I'm sure that's being emulated in there as well and you're emulating it on your own home computer. So, why would you want to do that? Well, there's a few reasons. Number one, for nostalgia. I mean, I've got 12 years invested in this computer. The only computer that I've got more investment in is the IBM PCs with Linux. Uh, preservation, you may have some old stuff that you want to get in touch with, uh, some old programs. Uh, <coughs> preservation of old memories. For instance, you know, hey, I wonder what that computer that I had did, or I wonder what the computer, you know, that that's, uh, my friend had uh, has. And also a learning experience, because a lot of these machines were very unique for their time. And there's a lot of things that have been lost over time, like uh, booting up into a computer that's got BASIC right out of the bat. That's gone. But the kids that boot up computers nowadays, they don't really have anything that they can boot into and say, this is a programming environment. Yeah, you got Python, you got C, and all that other kind of stuff. And Python brings a little bit of accessibility, but it's just, it's a great environment to learn on. And the biggest reason of all is because we can. That's the big one. That's the only reason that we really need. The problem with emulating hardware is all of these machines, well, first off, CPM and, and modern machines have a very minimal bootloader that's in them. On the old MSI 8080, you actually toggled that bootloader in there so you can get it to talk to the disk. On modern machines, we have the basic input-output system, the BIOS, that allows it to load its personality off of the disk. The computer really doesn't have a whole lot of personality outside of that. Most of these machines were designed, with the exception of the H89, to not use disk at all. So they would use cassette tapes. I mean, even the pet over there has got a cassette drive baked into it. The problem with that, though, is that because they don't have a whole lot of personality without their respective ROMs, they all need some kind of an OS ROM in order to run. You can emulate the hard hardware all day long. The problem is the software that's inside of there is what actually makes these machines work. It shouldn't be a problem. I mean, these are 20-year-old machines. Who cares about 20-year-old machines? I mean, they're a bunch of nostalgic old farts who want to play around with history. This is a problem, though. And the reason it is a problem is because the copyrights on these 
software pieces. I mean, the ROMs that are in here, they're all software. So they are all owned by someone. So the problem with that is some of these companies outsource their development. You had the Sinclair, which contracted with Nine Tiles Networks for the Sinclair Basic. Microsoft wrote the Commodore Basic. Um, digital licensed a version of GEM for the Atari ST. Not all of these companies wrote their own stuff. I mean, even IBM contracted Microsoft in order to do Quick and Dirty OS, and Microsoft, I'm sorry, and Microsoft subcontracted Quick and Dirty OS for MS DOS. Also, the problem, and Unfortunately, I went a little too far with this. Apple is the only company that has not gone bankrupt out of those machines that are in there. Most of these companies either went bankrupt, were sold, or both. Uh, a lot of these companies were sold off piecemeal, so they broke the companies up. You know, Atari, and the, I'll show a case study for Atari. The problem, too, is that figuring out who owns what requires a lot of lawyers, a lot of time, and a lot of digging figure out who owns what. It's a pain in the ass. So Atari, uh, brief history started off um, in the 1970s. In 1983, uh, it was split off into multiple divisions. So you have CoinOp and Atari Inc. Uh, it got merged, it was sold to Hasbro, it became Infograms, which renamed to Atari SA, blah, blah, blah. Figuring out who owns the Atari ROMs is a pain in the ass. Who owns it? Who knows? Who owns those? I couldn't get a decent answer online. Uh, part of what exacerbated this, and this is in the book uh, on game design by Chris Crawford, who we were hearing a lot of later on because he's one of my favorite game designers of all time, uh, said that when Atari broke off, um, when Jack Tramiel bought Atari, they were in the red, very deep. And so what he wanted to do in order to get a whole lot of cash was sell off the office equipment, among other things. Well, they managed to sell at auction one of their filing cabinets, a blocked filing cabinet. Nobody bothered to open it, except the person who bought it. The person who bought it then tried to contact Atari and managed to find, Chris, uh, through the San Jose Mercury News, Chris Crawford's number, who then informed him that this person bought this filing cabinet, and there were like 84 files with different titles of things. The person had